So, uh, I'm glad we could get get this set up. Uh, I'm thank you for uh, having come so numerously to uh, the Scala Days in New York. We're sold out. Uh, it's great to see you. I see some T-shirts from Scala Day New York three years ago. The uh, the bright uh, blue ones. I have one myself here. So uh, it's great to be back after three years. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is essentially the future of uh, Scala, the near future, and also quite a bit about the further future. So if we talk about the near future, or let's look first at the near past. Uh, as years go, uh, 2015 was a, was a fairly quiet year. Uh, so there weren't so many developments. There, were, there was steady growth, uh, however. So here you see two graphs. One is the jobs on Indeed.com, and the other is the Google Trends, and the jobs go up and down, but they go mostly up, and what's quite amazing is that on Google Trends, the trend for Scala Tutorial has been a, a really smooth and steady curve. So every year was more than the year before, and uh, so we, we really see not a hockey stick growth, but continuous growth, and that's in a sense more organic and, 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 uh, and very, very impressive in, in uh, if you see that graph. Now, 2016, things are heating up again, so this won't be uh, that, uh, that slow-paced development. There are many, many things that have recently happened or that will happen very soon, and I'm going to talk about those. So among the, the most important things that happen are the Scala Center that has been funded, founded and funded, uh, the Scala 212 release, uh, the plans to rethink some of the Scala libraries, the developments on new target platforms, and then the work on DOT, the foundations of Scala, and DOTI, the new uh, Scala compiler code base. So let's take that one by one. First one, Scala Center. <clears throat> With the Scala Center, we now have a new steward for Scala, essentially a foundation-like entity that will focus and organize the community and the community contributions around Scala. So its mission is to undertake projects that benefit all of the Scala community, and uh, we have quite heavy and uh, industrial support from uh, Lightband, Goldman Sachs, Nitro, IBM, 47 Degrees, and Verizon, and I thank these companies for helping us here. Uh, I won't dwell further on that because Heather Miller will talk about that uh, in her keynote to tomorrow in much more detail, so I will just defer to Heather for now. Uh, Scala 212 uh, is uh, around the corner, so it will come out this summer. And Scala 212 is a significant step because it's uh, the first version of Scala that's optimized for Java 8. So that means it uses Java 8's lambdas and default methods in its uh, bytecode generation, which means in turn that the code can be more compact, sometimes also faster, and also that compilation times will be helped because essentially all those inner classes that were simulating the lambdas took quite a lot of compilation time to generate. So the code will be slimmer, and uh, the, the, the uh, interop with Java 8, of course, will be basically improved. Uh, Projected release date is mid-2016. Uh, in case you're still on Java 6 or 7, uh, rest assured, uh, the Scala 2.11 will be around for quite a while, so Lightband has, is planning to actually have an extended uh, maintenance cycle for 2.11 uh, in order to make this tr transition uh, less abrupt. Uh, in detail, there are 33 features, uh, new features in the release notes, so it's just the start of the list. Uh, there are 336 pull requests closed with another 40 more to go, projected to be uh, merged before the final release is out. And there are 65 committers, so here you just see the top of the committer page. So all a significant effort and uh, we're very happy to see this come to a final uh, release this year. And also, I'm very happy that finally, programming in Scala version 3 is out and that it has been updated for 2.12. So it will be the first book that actually contains the 2.12 editions. And uh, there's a book signing on Tuesday over lunch uh, at the Artima booth, so I'll be there to sign the books, even though I must say that with the third book I had not that much to do, not as much to do as with the previous two editions. But I'm really very, very glad that it's out and I advised the author team of what to do there. <clears throat> 
So beyond 2.12, uh, uh, since 2.12 will be out this year, it's time to actually look at the next steps after that. So what are we planning to do for 2.13, 2.14 and so on. So 2.13, that's the next release after 2.12, we plan to focus on the libraries. So 2.12 was essentially focused on the compiler generation, the compiler backend. 2.13 will be about the libraries. In particular, we plan, we plan to study ways to uh, revamp the collections, to make them even simpler to use, because despite their glitches and uh, corner cases, I think by and large collections are pretty easy to use. But the question is, can we keep that ease of use and maybe remove some of the corner cases? Um, uh, an important um, guidance, an important point of uh, inspiration there is what Spark did with collections. Uh, in particular that Spark uh, has this uh, mode to actually construct collection operations lazily, to essentially construct the operation and then run a complex operation in one step. And also the way uh, Spark has integrated uh, pair RDDs, so, or pair datasets now, uh, essentially uh, collections over pairs in a very smooth way in the general collections is something that's definitely worth imitating in my mind, so we will essentially plan to experiment with, with that and see whether we can import some of that in the standard collections. Uh, the way we go about that is that we currently have straw man proposals under study. So because collections, is, it's a big library, it takes significant effort to write one. So there are not many people who actually would put up all that efforts to write a trial and then see it all go to waste because it's not adopted. So what we did first is essentially reduce the scope and said, when can we sort of study the problems with collections in the lab, in the small, uh, so that we have a prototype that would take ideally less than 500 lines, so which would be not that difficult to write, and that could already highlight the uh, design issues and potential design problems with collections. So far we have two of those uh, Strawman proposals, one uh, traditional, uh, like the current collections are pretty much inheritance based, the other decorator based, and uh, there's an open invitation to pro provide more of these Strawman proposals. In all the in all this, the the uh, over the guideline, of course, is to stay essentially for the end user compatible what's out there. So what we want to do is mostly things under the hood uh, that we say, well, we want to essentially give you a, a nicer way to interact with collections and maybe uh, we can simplify some of the types, but rest assured nobody will want to take back map or filter or flat map or operations like that. Okay. Uh, the other thing beyond 2.12 that we have just started of thinking and that in, in a little way is, co is connected to the questions of the, of the uh, collections is uh, how can we achieve better modularization? Uh, so the current standard library is a big jar and uh, the advantage of a big jar is that it's somewhat of a batteries included thing but there are also issues with what if some of the batteries in this thing actually wore out and there are actually better solutions out there there now uh, in different libraries it will be very hard to switch over uh, also the problem is uh, the bigger the thing is the harder it is to maintain to, to maintain it to to ensure binary compatibility and so on so one interesting proposal is to actually split the standard library into a Scala core, a core library, which would be smaller than the current Scala library, but I believe would still contain essentials like the collections, uh, and into a Scala platform, which would be bigger than the current Scala library, and that would include much needed new additions like maybe uh, JSON handling, I.O., uh, things like that. So that that's, uh, has, is something that the Haskell community has done, and uh, I believe it's an interesting thing to study to see whether we want to do the same thing. The advantage would be that essentially different people would care about different parts of the libraries. The core library is, it would be essentially the Scala compiler team, which has to look after the core library because the compiler will depend on it. But for the platform, we could hopefully enlist new groups of people to actually care, take care of the platform and the platform could be more organic and dynamic than a single jar. So I would very much during these days maybe also sample your input or if uh, some of you say well platform great idea I want to help and maybe take care of some of these things that would also be great if we could kick off some, some initiatives there. 
The other thing that <coughs> also has happened in uh, in 2012, uh, sorry, in uh, 2016, are uh, the alternative platforms. So Scala JS is now uh, 069, and uh, I think the question always is, well, when will it jump to 1.0? Uh, which I, I'm not sure. Maybe Sebastian will answer it in his talk. Uh, but it's it's actually very very mature for a, a version number that's that low uh, as 06. So. Uh, the new additions there were native anonymous classes, support native support for tuples, JUnit supports, and faster code generation, and a shiny new website. Uh, the other thing which is much more mysterious, and we're going to find out more about that later on in the conference, is this thing here. So that's a web page, and if you click on the double arrow here at the, at the bottom, it says coming soon. And uh, so, so it's it's uh, an interesting question uh, what that's going to be. Well, it's going to be a Scala compiler for LLVM uh, at very much in the early stages. Uh, but uh, again, we we find out more in Dennis Shabalin's talk later at the conference. And then uh, there's the dot. So there has been lots of movements and developments around the dot. Dot, of course, is uh, the dependent object calculus, uh, which we have uh, finally proven to be a sound foundation of Scala. So dot is what the researchers uh, like to call a calculus, which means it's a mini language that can be formally studied and of, about which we can establish properties which are then actually proved by machines, so they, we, we, are, we are perfectly sure that the properties actually hold. The language subset is chosen so that we can prove formal statements about it, and it should be suitable to encode in one way the, or, or another the rest of the language in it. Uh, that is actually a huge step because it concludes an eight-year effort where we tried to come up with such a foundation, and we got stuck for a long time in our efforts to actually prove this foundation sound. So the, later in the last year and beginning of this year, we have made significant progress and now are much, we can happily say that Scala is on much firmer foundations than it was a year ago. Also, this opens the door to do language work with much better confidence than before. So we can now actually, when there's a new feature in Scala for proposal, we can now actually evaluate and say, well, uh, this addition, and most additions will, would affect the type system, is that actually sound, uh, or would we have doubts? And the way we would do this is to, is to say, well, uh, let's try to find an encoding in our base calculus, and if that encoding is sound, and we know the base calculus is sound, then the whole thing is sound. So I wanted to give you a quick uh, overview, uh, not that I, I just to, for, for those of you that don't know what this sort of calculus is, what it looks like. So it's essentially a mini, mini subset of Scala. Uh, the only values in that subset are functions, uh, which we write here, so they're anonymous functions. Uh, and uh, anonymous classes, so that's the top here that you see under values. Uh, then uh, under definitions we have only parameterless method definitions, so just def a equals t, and type aliases, that's all we have. And under uh, terms we have uh, the values that you've seen, uh, then we have variables, we have function application, we have field selection, and we have local definitions, so essentially a vowel in a block. That's all that we have here. Uh, about the types, we're similarly minimal, so we have the top type, any, the top bottom type, nothing, uh, type projection or selection, x.a, then uh, the function type, and then in essentially methods with a single uh, uh, sorry, records with a single definition, like the parameterless method declaration, def a colon t, then uh, a, an abstract type, which has a lower bound and an upper bound, an intersection of two types, and recursion. Intersection, you might say, ah, we don't have that in Scala, that's true, but I'll come back to that. We will actually have that in the new Scala versions. So essentially, for now, you can think of the ampersand and as a width. It's close enough. As a, as a first first approximation. Okay, so that's our mini language, and it turns out that if you think about it, that it is uh, not straightforward, but possible to essentially take the rest of the Scala language and condense it so that you can, for every feature, you can encode it 
into this mini language. The encodings are not pretty. Nobody would expect programmers to actually do that. That's why we have a richer language and not a mini language like that. But for the theory, it's just important that they're doable. So what we proved then uh, uh, is, is the following theorem that we said uh, if a term, so an expression, has some type T and the evaluation of the term terminates, so the program will come to a halt, then the result will be a value V of the same type T. That's what type soundness says. So essentially type soundness says the compiler doesn't lie. The compiler says, well, this program has this type, this expression has this type, then at runtime it will evaluate to a value that has this type. Or it might not terminate by going into an infinite loop, infinite recursion, throwing, throwing an, an exception, and so on. Those are the things that we chose not to talk about. This looks like a pretty harmless theorem, but I told you it, takes, it took us eight years to prove it, so it was a pretty, pretty large effort. So why is it important? Because it gives us a technique to also reason about the correctness of other language features. And I'll show you later that actually there are language features in Scala where we have shown by this technique that they are not correct, that they're unsound, and I'll show you what we're going to do with them. Okay, so that was dot. Dot is the theory. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about quickly is the uh, compiler that's based on the theory, so that's called Dotty. Uh, Dotty is uh, the working name for our new Scala compiler, so it's a new code base. It takes some bits of the old Scala compiler NSC, but not too many. Most of them are built up from scratch, and uh, most importantly, it builds on Dot in its internal data structures. So essentially, it has the same internal data structures that you see in this minimal calculus. And it does a quite a lot of simplifications to get there, to get to these minimal data structures. In particular, it doesn't. Re it will pretend that the uh, language doesn't have any parameters, uh, any type parameters. So you say, well, no generic functions, no generic things, no generic classes. Uh, that seems rather radical. But of course, again, the language would have the type parameters, but they, they are encoded as what you've seen in the, in the calculus, abstract types with upper and lower bounds, and essentially type selection, type projection. So the compiler is quite radical in that way that it really tries to reduce very quickly to this minimal subset of the language that we, uh, is the one that we understand very well. Uh, so, for that compiler, the uh, first developer preview is uh, around the corner. Uh, we hope that we will get uh, something out by uh, the next Scala days in Berlin, maybe. And that first developer preview is really targeted at contributors and experimenters. So it's not production ready, it won't be production ready for a while, but essentially if you want to get involved in that and uh, help uh, experiment with it, uh, contribute to it, uh, play with it, uh, now is a good time to get started. Uh, technical data of the compiler. Uh, it's currently a bit more than half the size of the current Scala compiler, about 45,000 lines of code. Current Scala compiler has measured by the same uh, inclusion of modules about 75,000 lines. And it's about twice the speed of the current Scala compiler. But that actually should improve significantly in the future because we have still lots and lots of debug code that we have in this, in this compiler that we haven't uh, taken out yet and that we know uh, slows down compilation significantly. So, the architecture of the Dotty compiler uh, you see here on that picture. So, on the left hand side, you have the new compiler Dotty. On the right hand is essentially the old ones, the uh, NSC. And both compilers are, in a sense, similar in that they uh, both have a front end, a parser that produces an AST or abstract syntax tree. And then there are transforms, uh, which uh, gradually simplify that ASTs. And then they go is essentially to the backend that generates the bytecode on the JVM. And that backend is actually shared. So GenB code is the same one for NSC and Dotty. Uh, the other interesting bit is what happens with the, uh, uh, with the pickled information. So pickling is used to support separate compilation. When a compiler compiles a file, it has to essentially make the information in that file available to other uh, compilation units. So it pickles them. That's typically an attribute in the class file. That's what 
the Scala compiler knows about your Scala program. And uh, the pickling info in uh, Dotty is, has, has changed, so it is now uh, something called Tasty. So Tasty is essentially a serialized version of these same ASTs. So it can be much more, it's much more complete and much more precise than what we had in the in the old Scala C compiler, and it opens the the the, uh, the road to many uh, interesting possibilities. Some of which you will also hear at this conference, namely whole program optimization and, and using the linker. Another thing that we um, haven't really ex uh, uh, finished yet, but um, which I think is very very interesting, is that Tasty also gives us a way to avoid binary compatibility problems because it gives us a new way to ship libraries. So libraries can now ship with this thing and then essentially adapt it on the platform that you're running, uh, the, uh, the, the version of Scala, the version, version of Java, or maybe Scala.js or native, depending on essentially what, your, what the setup on the user, on the client is. So Tasty gives us essentially a universal interchange format for Scala files and that's why it's exciting. Okay, so that was the uh, part about the compiler. Now, the purpose of that compiler is uh, that it gives us a better way to go forward also evolving the language, because uh, essentially having a cleaner code base lets you move faster uh, when you want to essentially change things, and it lets you move with more confidence. There are less essentially uh, stupid backwards compatibility requirements, the less essentially historical accidents that prevent you from doing the right thing. So the uh, reason for actually spending now almost three weeks, I think three years on, on this compiler was really to be able to move more confidently in evolving the language. Now, why do we want to do that? Well, uh, or why do I want to do that? That's just my personal goal. My personal goal has always been to make Scala the best programming language I know how to make. And uh, I also know that this work is never finished because we will always learn new ways and uh, essentially we will discard techniques that we thought were state-of-the-art before and we will, we will find new techniques. And I also know that any such best notion of best can only be a local optimum because of course people differ on what they think is best and even for one person different applications have have different best tools but what you definitely can do is to say well for the uh, for the application domain that we have the language, for the applications that are out there, can we find a, essentially a, a language that is a local optimum or the, essentially that locally improves with, without changing the character of the language, just saying, well, there is something that brings out that character, that application profile, better than what we had before. So what is that application profile, that character? Well, for me, really, is the, the, the fundamental cornerstones of Scala is that we have a functional language, we also have an object-oriented language, uh, essentially supporting modularity through classes and objects. Uh, the function, the evaluation is strict, so we won't try to pretend to be a lazy language. Uh, the type inference is local, based on propagation. We won't try to essentially get, uh, g g g become too fancy with Hindley Milner because we know that it would restrict a lot of the other features. Nothing against Hindley Milner, it's a fantastic type inference technique, but it does restrict a lot of the other uh, design choices that you have in a language, and Scala has essentially violated a lot of them already. And the fifth one, which I also think has we have learned that it's much more important than we thought before, is implicits. Now, implicits, a lot of you might shake your head and say, well, implicits have a bad rep, bad rep right? So, so they're, they're really uh, uh, <coughs> a, 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 a... But I think a lot of the bad reputations from implicits comes from the past, when we just didn't know how to use them correctly. <coughs> and I think we... I will say later at the end of the talk some ideas how to... <coughs> we might actually get to a stage where we can avoid the worst abuses of implicits. But the more I look at implicits, that I think the more potential they have. And other languages are noting that as well. For instance, OCaml, uh, the a language which is fairly close to Scala, much older than Scala, but fairly close in its orientation, strict functional language with an object system, recently added implicits very similar to Scala implicits uh, to their language. I think it's in proposal stage, but I, I expect that it will be accepted. 
generally a lot of languages are moving in this in the space Scala uh, has the space Scala has established not just OCaml but uh, if you look at Swift or Kotlin or the later versions of C sharp you see that it's a lot of languages that, that actually move in this space and what I do not want to try is essentially beat these languages feature by feature I would rather try to find a, essentially a language that has a smaller number of features but that brings them out more clearly. So that's essentially the goal that I have and I think we have the, we have the advantage of a lot of experience in that space. So we, 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 are, we are many, many years ahead of uh, a lot of the, the later languages here. So the goals are of this work then are to, for me to deepen the synthesis of functional programming and modular programming. So you know how to do functional programming, but to bring it together with modules, objects, classes, uh, that's what Scala pioneered, and I think that's what we can improve. Uh, we can still improve on. Uh, we should continue doing that. Uh, improve the connection of Scala with its theoretical foundations. First step, there are theoretical foundations, so now we just uh, essentially have to take them seriously and have to say, well, essentially, what, uh, how do we map the language to those foundations? Improve the guarantees of the type system. So I think that's something that we have uh, learned over the years when Scala was, uh, came out. Essentially, any notion of static type was dubious. Uh, the hot kids of the day were languages like Ruby and, uh, and Python and JavaScript. Uh, so essentially dynamic programming was all the rage and the static type system was essentially betting on the wrong horse at the time. So at the time uh, the design of Scala was pretty conservative in the way what we want to capture in the types. We want to say, well, the most important thing is that a Ruby programmer is not completely disgusted when they see Scala types, right? So we want to make them light white. We don't want to be too dogmatic. Uh, we don't want to essentially make life difficult, even though we might catch some error here or there. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, the, the important thing is that we do have a strong typing discipline. I think that has changed. We have seen the community move much more into directions where, where certain features that were, we had as a matter of course, like exceptions, now are dubious because they said, well, we don't, the types don't catch the exceptions. Should you use exceptions? And uh, in my mind, I think exceptions do have a role, but I definitely see the point that the types don't capture it. So the question is, can we actually enrich the types to capture things like exceptions and other things? But among all that, I really wanted to stay simple and approachable. So those are the goals. So what I will do now is I will give you a whirlwind tour of what we have so far and what we might plan in the future. So a whirlwind tour of Dottie. So the first thing is uh, we want to take it seriously that we want to keep the language simple. And if you want to keep the language simple, then you have to start by cutting out some features because otherwise you get accretion. So we cut out quite a few features that we either can get replaced by something simpler or uh, that we just found they didn't carry their weight. First is procedure syntax. Well, that's an easy one. Uh, so everybody hates uh, the, well, maybe not hate, but the consensus is you can really do without the procedure syntax for the run here above. And what's more is we can rewrite that automatically to uh, essentially the uh, slightly more verbose thing at the bottom. So that's been done. Uh, delay in it really wasn't used a lot, so it gets uh, cut without replacements. Uh, Macros. So macros are uh, a difficult one, that's why they're the biggest thing here in the middle. Uh, the current kind of macros was always experimental, as you know. So essentially macros is an experimental feature. And uh, we have come to realize that what what's out there is really not something we want to go with in the long run. We want something different, which is much simpler, much more robust, and which in particular is not based on reflection. I think that's one of the problems of the current macros that essentially they execute at runtime using Java reflection. For Java reflection, you ever say, well, what with other platforms? Uh, there is no Java reflection. And the other thing is Java reflection means during the compiler you execute arbitrary code. And that's, for me, very scary. So uh, not, not just during the compiler, potentially during the IDE. On every keystroke, there's something that you execute here. So, so that's why, why I think we, we should rethink that. Early initializers, who here knows what early initializers are? Uh, some of you do, good, yeah. So, well, it's, 
it's this thing here. So what we had so far, most of you don't know what it is, rightfully so. So it's that we uh, essentially could initialize something before we call the superclass constructor. So that, 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 that was the syntax for it. And the reasons were basically were that with traits, uh, the only, you can't do anything before you run uh, the initializer of a trait, normally. And sometimes the initializer of a trait needs to know something of the base class, like the setting of a field or things like that. And there was no way around it. And uh, that's why we had the syntax where we said, well, that here, if D is a trait, then we can ensure that uh, we have this thing here. Uh, so they will be uh, replaced by trait parameters, thankfully. Uh, existential types, uh, so the more complicated forms of existential types, the one you see here at the top, uh, they're no longer supported, wildcards are still supported. Uh, the reason is that almost all code that actually used these existential types was extremely brittle. So I came to realize that, that, that these complex existential types, they are almost a code smell. And the second, they just don't really fit with the foundations. They are essentially an addition that sits very uneasily with this dependent type formalization that we have. So that don't, they, they're going to be dropped. Uh, general type projection. So that was this hash code, the projection code. And that's beloved by some uh, because it lets you do um, uh, lambda calculus in a type system. So that's the thing, that's the reason for uh, Scala's type systems, Turing completeness, or one of the reasons. So you can do SKK, uh, SKI combinator calculus in a type system. You can look it up on the web. It's quite, quite amazing. Unfortunately, it's also unsound. So there's an issue, issue uh, 50, in the Dotty uh, issue, issue list that actually shows that these things lead to unsoundness, so to class cast exceptions uh, at runtime. Uh, and furthermore, by what we learned in the dot calculus, we found that there's not really a good way to essentially make this sound, because we essentially developed these proof principles and it just didn't work with the approach of these general type projections. So they will go as well, but the class projection where C is just a class, which you use to essentially express uh, inner classes like the ones you see from Java, that actually turns out to be perfectly sound and that will still be available. Okay, so we have taken a lot of things away. Um, uh, maybe some of them will hurt, uh, but I, I, I hope good riddance for most of them. So what do we add? Uh, so the first thing we add is something that you saw in the dot calculus that was this ampersand, intersection types. And that replaces the what we call a compound type, T with U, but it's much nicer. Uh, it's nicer because it's commutative. So T and U is really the same thing as U and T. If you try that out with the width, that's actually not true. That was one of the glitches that, that we had in Scala's type system. And essentially the reason of, or the, the source of the error is that we confounded implementation inheritance, where it very much matters what you get last, because that's, that's going to be the overriding implementation, with types where you only talk about what is in a type, but not how you implement it. So it's a typical, it sort of goes in the same thing that you confuse subtyping with, sub, with inheritance. Here we make that mistake, and we're going to correct it. Now, if you have intersection types, then the dual of intersection types is union types. And we're going to have them also. So the, the, the union types, which are written T or U. Uh, union types have some interesting applications in, in, in software. Uh, so they're definitely useful. Uh, but for me, the biggest, biggest plus of union types is that they avoid exploding labs. Uh, so there are all these uh, examples around that essentially a type error goes over many, many pages. And that was due because essentially the previous, uh, the current Scala doesn't have union types. So the compiler has to approximate them somehow. The way the compiler approximates it, it essentially says the union of T and U is take all the super types of T and U and put them all together with an AND. So essentially I go take the super types and put them all together with an AND. And unfortunately sometimes this can get huge. It can even get infinite, infinitely huge. Uh, so uh, the, that, that's a real problem that either you have fairly arbitrary cutoff uh, uh, rules for the labs, uh, that where you say, well, at some point you just don't care anymore, or uh, you uh, you have these huge things. In practice, the current Scala C compiler has, has both. It has fairly arbitrary cutoff rules and huge things, and it's uh, that, that just, just shows that it's very, very hard to control. 
Okay, so that's why we have union types. The third one is a pretty small one, but it, it removes an annoyance. Uh, remember that sometimes you have to write this case, for instance, if you have a list of pairs and you want to map over that, because map takes only a single parameter, essentially you want to essentially pattern match on the pair, so you have to do this with this case. But uh, you, I guess m uh, most of us have already, uh, at some point or other, reached for this syntax here. And then the compiler told us that it wasn't available, that he couldn't do it. Now in the future, you, it, it will be available. There's a, there's a conversion that, that actually lets you essentially write this and do the other. The next thing is, like I said, trait parameters. <clears throat> so traits can have parameters, like classes can have. So they're very much in line with classes now. Uh, so that basically means that traits and classes are uh, essentially two sides of the same thing. If it's abstract, then use trait. If it's concrete, use class. As a, as a first guidance, I think that's, that's a pretty good uh, rule of thumb. Uh, next thing is static methods and fields. Uh, so you can ri now write, essentially have a static annotation. You write it in the object, but it will mean that these things are implemented as static members in the underlying Java uh, bytecode, <coughs> which should help a lot. Uh, sometimes for performance, these things are still uh, a little bit faster than actually going via an object, and more so for interop. Uh, because uh, in, in a lot of the, the, the uh, Java frameworks have fairly uh, strict requirements what should be static, a static field, like uh, serialization and hibernate and, and things like that. So it should help with that. Um, multiversal equality, I just had a, a, a proposal out there, so it's not yet merged, but I guess it probably will be. So that means we will make equals and not equals type safe. Um, equals and not equals, thank you. <laughs> that was like the last holdout of the dynamically typed nature, and essentially you can you, you can have the excuse, we got it from Java, but it's not really a well, good excuse. So. Uh, <laughs> So the, uh, the problems are mostly for refactorings that I, I, I recently had a case where I, I wanted to do a refactoring, uh, was rather involved in the uh, Dottie compiler code base, and I scared away from it because I said, well, with these things, we will never be able to control essentially all the points where we might introduce essentially an incompatibility that doesn't get detected. Scala is pretty good in all other instances to say, well, it requires your cooperation, of course. You have to put in very good types, uh, precise types for your data types, but when you do, then it gives us in return the assurance that you can refactor with confidence, except for universal equality. So I think that's really the last holdout, so we're going to fix that. Um, named, sorry. And here the last one was named type parameters. So that's essentially a thing where, uh, on the one hand, it fixes a uh, sort of an asymmetry that you can say you can have normal parameters with val, and that means it's a field in the class. Uh, now, for the type parameters, we said internally a type parameter is a field of the class, but it will be a field with a name that's invisible to you because otherwise the name might conflict with other things. But of course, that's a, an opportunity to say we might give you that 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 uh, power to say, well, if I want the type parameter to really be a field in the class, then uh, now there's very very concise syntax for that. And one of the immediate advantages of doing that is that it gives you a neat way also to, uh, to for partial type parameterization. Because now you could write with map like that, you could write map of key equals int, and that means you haven't specified the value. And if that uh, map is not a type but a function, then you can do that and the other types will just be inferred. So that's something that people have asked for a long time that we said, well, if you have many complicated types, then either you have to give them all and it's tedious, or you have to rely on inference from, on them all, but what if I maybe some type can't be inferred, so I have to give it, but the others should be inferred. So that's, that's an advantage here. So motivation here were overall better foundations, easier, safer to use, and more orthogonality. So um, there are also some improvements in detail. So type system, like I said, strongly influenced by DOT. Uh, there's a better integration of type refinements. Uh, the type inference has been uh, redone uh, from the ground up. So now we have uh, essentially a uh, 
fairly simple in inference algorithm that works with a subtyping constraint solver. Previously, we didn't have that. It was sort of an ad hoc way we, did, we dealt with these things. And that means that we can actually, I'm, I'm very confident, we haven't done it yet, but I'm very confident that it will be much simpler to actually specify what inference does. Because we, we essentially can say, okay, type inference, it traverses your program, it generates these constraints, and the constraints will be solved at certain points, and that's the job of the constraint solver, but which can be specified declaratively. Uh, we worked on implicit search, so search algorithm got faster, and it's now better behaved for contravariant types. Implicit search was pretty useless for types like uh, that were naturally contravariant, like equality types or comparison and things like that. Uh, we worked on value classes, so uh, nested value classes has been done, and arrays of value classes will be in the code base very shortly. Okay. So who's working on all that? So, so far it was mostly my team at EPFL, including Dimitri Petrashko, Kuyo Matres, Vladimir Nikolaev, Felix Malger, and many others that I've not, not mentioned. Uh, so there are a lot of young people coming into the development, and that's great. Uh, Scala team at Lightband also help, in particular with infrastructure, reviews and suggestions. And that's a thing where, again, contributions and collaborations by others would be very much appreciated. Uh, you might ask, well, where's the tooling? Well, it's just coming along, uh, not, uh, not that, uh, uh, but the developments are all very recent, so uh, we have a basic SPT integration, so you can run it on SPT. We're currently working on incremental compilation, so dotty compilation from SPT. We have a REPL, and the REPL even has, has syntax highlighting, yeah. Uh, <laughs> An IDE, I'm very much looking forward to IntelliJ's talk later at, conference, at, at the conference where they will tell us where they are with it. Uh, they worked on it. Uh, doc generation uh, is under works, so particularly the, the new doc, uh, doc generation tool will have dynamic hyperlinks so that you can cross-link libraries. That means JavaScript thingies that previously the problem, as you know, is that once you refer to uh, functions in uh, or items in another library, then you didn't get the links anymore because everything had to be compiled together. So the, the documentation was incompatible with um, separate compilation. And uh, again, I will only say it in the briefest of words: there's this linker, which is a whole program analyzer optimizer using Tasty for serialization, and it, uh, among several other things, it makes uh, specialization cheaper and much more robust. And uh, that will be all of it from me, because uh, Dimitri will talk later about it at the conference. Good. And um, so far, so good. But the question is, well, this looks like a fairly immature problem, a project which, which um, solves some things, some itches, which is nice. But is it really worth sort of betting on it? Or is it really worth getting involved in it? So I also wanted to tell you a little bit where I see the future, because that's the thing that at least for me invites, uh, excites me most. So what we have planned, and in some in parts we have very concrete plans, are uh, several things that we want to add and explore. So here are the most important ones. Uh, Scala meta, implicit function types, effect systems, null safety, generic programming, and better records. So let me take them again one by one, and afterwards I guarantee that your head spins. Um, <laughs> so Scala Meta is essentially Eugene Bomako's new project on which he has been working for a while and which is scheduled to essentially be integrated in Dotty. Uh, so the way it's integrated will differ a little bit from macros. So you see that here. So essentially what we plan to have is two uh, new keywords. One is called inline and the other is called meta. So inline, as the name implies, is just inlining. It says you have this thing and it's it's a compile, known compile time thing. It's a compile time method body. It's a compile time constant. Particularly inline will replace final as this funny way to say this is a compile time constant. So final was sort of taken from Java, but it was very weird. So now you say inline x equals 3, and you know it's a compile time constant 3. And you can also say inline to a parameter, which means, well, uh, the, the actual value at this point must be a compile time constant. So you will be able to specify that. And all that has nothing with, to do with metaprogramming. It's just simple inlining, partial evaluation, you could say. But you can already do quite a bit of that. Then the next step is meta. So meta is essentially the switch where you now go from essentially compiler values to trees. 
So you say, well, if you have an int, then uh, let's say here's a, a float as a parameter, then inside the meta block, uh, I will know that this the actual argument is a syntax tree, an abstract syntax tree that gives me a float at the end. So I can inspect that syntax tree with quasi quotes, and I can construct new syntax trees and return them. On the other hand, if the uh, actual argument is an inline x int, then uh, the meta part will know, well, that's now an integer. That's an integer, integer that I know and can use. So that's the new uh, separation. The other thing that's uh, very important is that we will no longer run this with reflection. That means we uh, will write an interpreter that essentially will interpret Scala as far as it's needed for macro expansion, which is pretty much everything, uh, in an interpreter that can be run by the compiler. Big advantage of running it with an interpreter is not only is it portable, but it's also sandboxed. We can say, well, we won't actually take all your heap, take arbitrary long time to do that. The compiler can actually have very strict limits what macros are allowed to do. And that would at least me, let me sleep much sounder than, than right now. So that was Scala Meta. The next thing is something that looks really small, but is actually huge. Uh, that's implicit function types. So an implicit function type, you see that here at the top, is actually rather simple. You have a normal function type, context ROS, and you can write implicit in front of the context, like an implicit parameter, but in the function type. So the meaning of that is that if you um, call the function f with some uh, uh, sorry, if you call a function that has as its result type an implicit function type, like context s, then of course as if there was an ex ex as if there was an implicit parameter here given directly that the thing gets called. So it's like an implicit method. And furthermore, in, in the body of the function we can also essentially refer to this context thing because that's essentially as part of this result type uh, we assume that an implicit thing is passed. So this looks rather small, it's just essentially a way to uh, essentially hide these implicit parameters but it's actually huge because it's the first time we can abstract over implicit parameters. Previously implicit parameters had, had to be written out every time you use them you had to write them out again. There was no way to abbreviate them. And as you all know, once I have a mean of abstraction I can go enormously far with that. So now we have a, about a very important feature in Scala naming implicit parameter. So we have a way to actually abstract that and that gives us enormous power. It also eliminates a lot of boilerplate. So that leads us directly to the next thing which is uh, even bigger and that's uh, effects. Uh, so the way to treat effects, we will try to treat effects in Scala, is as implicit capabilities. So in, instead of saying, well, here's a thing that throws an exception, I say, well, here's a thing that needs the capability to throw an exception. And I express that capability as an implicit parameter. First, as a parameter, somebody has to pass that uh, capability, and then I make it implicit because it means that uh, I avoid all the boilerplate of passing, but you can throw this exception, you can throw this exception. I can essentially hide that in the type, but it's still there. It will, will give you a type error if uh, you do something unexpected. And of course, with the implicit function types, we can make this very, very concise, as concise as the best of the effect systems out there. So I recently got, uh, got a grant to look at that over the next years. Uh, with significant resources, so uh, we can expect uh, some, something uh, very uh, interesting in that domain. But it's uh, something where we say we, we have a detailed plan, uh, now let's put it in, in motion and implement it and then evaluate it, and hopefully it will, will work out, but uh, it's too early to make any promises here. Okay, the next thing then would be nullable types. Uh, so it's kind of an embarrassment for Scala that Scala is sort of the last language that still has null, right? So a lot of newer languages don't have it anymore. Kotlin or, or Swift or, or none of these languages has null. And they say, oh, Scala, oh, they still have null. How, how retro is that? <laughs> so <laughs> um, so there, were, there were some efforts to actually do that, uh, avoid, uh, make null uh, explicit uh, previously, uh, but they were sort of got stuck very early because uh, there's the objection which I 
totally get it to say, well, we as Scala community, we don't really use now that much. It's been sort of replaced. People almost never have null point exceptions because they have learned to use options or other ways to treat it. So it's not that important. But actually, there's another thing that has become more important, and that's again has to do with the foundations that we say. Now that we actually have good foundations, null is an embarrassment because with null you can really do horrible trickeries that really don't have any way to, 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 to be modeled in the foundations. The foundations require that certain things are not null, or otherwise you would say all bets are off. And of course there are many amusing counterexamples where Scala compiler, you're drunk, uh, that, uh, that involve a lot of them invoke, involve some creative use of nulls. So, so, so it would be interesting and, and I think important to avoid that. And also it would be very cheap now for several reasons. One is we can actually model null as a union type. We have union types. So we can have a type for null, uh, which says, well, that's the null object and no other object is in that type. And we have or. So we can say the uh, proposed syntax t question mark is actually t or null. Salem did the same thing. Uh, and that means we have a very good basis to talk about these things. And the other thing that's uh, very interesting here is to say, well, what do we do about null dereferencing? So there's the embarrassing situation here, like you have system out and it's a print stream question mark because it, because it comes from Java, it can be null, right? Uh, so if you want to write system out dot print on, then the type system will say, no, no, you can't do that. But that's that's kind of annoying. We want to keep writing out, writing system out dot print on, right? So the the interesting th thing here would be to say, well, uh, raising a null pointer exception is an effect like raising other exceptions as well, and we will essentially force you to declare it explicitly. But there's a mode actually which we need for backwards compatibility anyway that says I'm impure. I can raise whatever exceptions and do whatever other side effects. And most all Scala programs will start out in impure state and maybe gradually might move towards pure state by essentially taking away these capabilities to be impure. So that means that we can actually give you a choice to say, as long as I'm, I'm impure, I can also write system out dot print home. If I claim I won't ever raise a null point exception, then yes, of course, you can't do that anymore because the out might be null and you have to essentially guard against that thing. But the choice is yours as a programmer. So that's, that's why I think this thing has actually a chance of flying now. Next thing is uh, gen uh, generic programming. Uh, so that's another thing that essentially has been a long way in coming. Uh, the embarrassment is tuple 22, product 22, all these 22s, so uh, maybe, maybe their time should be up. And uh, there are ways to do it. Shapeless has demonstrated it. Haskell has demonstrated it with, with scrap your boilerplate before. And I think we should work hard and, and uh, make, make a serious effort to actually get that into, into the base language. So one way. We will do that, uh, for instance, is to say if you have a tuple, like a three tuple STU as types, then that's really an abbreviation only for essentially something that in uh, shapeless would be uh, described by an H list. So essentially a pair of pair of pair of unit. Uh, so these, 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 these um, tuples would have a list like structure, but unless, unlike shapeless, they would be implemented as efficiently as now. So we would actually have essentially classes for tuples up to four, and otherwise, uh, and later on, we would use an array to, to not essentially have any indirection in these things. Okay, and finally, better records. So essentially what generic programming was for tuples, we want to do when we have labels as well. So that's also needed for, let's say, things to, to support essentially uh, data engines like Slick or Spark really well. So that's another thing that we want to look at here. Good. So. Lots of blue sky thing, lots of excitement. Uh, you might say, well, are these our problems? Uh, don't we have other problems as a Scala community? What about the guardrails? Uh, because after all, I think Scala's premise has been always and still is that we want to trust developers to do the right thing. That was always that. Scala appealed to, always appealed to a developer to, 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 to give you a lot of power, give you and on the return trust you to do the right thing with, with that power. But what if you don't? Or can we even agree what the right thing is? So I want to conclude that talk with some essentially thoughts about how, what we can do about these things without actually cutting down the language too much and making the language very complicated with lots of ad hoc rules because we think we might prevent, we should prevent one or the other of doing a terrible thing. <laughs> 
So I think my first advice would be read this. Uh, how he's blog strategic scholar style principle of least power. If you haven't read it yet, please do read it. Make your collaborators read it. Agree as a team that this is the guy, the, 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 the route to follow. Uh, if somebody violates this uh, principle of least power, then essentially put it in, a, in the pull request review and these things. That's very important. Principle of least power simply says for everything you do, you should use the language construct with the least power that achieves that thing. Or in other words, go, don't go overboard with essentially playing with a lot of advanced technology uh, because that essentially the users of that library will be a hard time. The reason for using the least expressive thing is the, also the principle of minimal surprise. The, 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 the less powerful your te the techniques uh, are uh, to, to achieve that thing, the more that your design space is constrained. And somebody who reads your code wants the design space to be constrained because the more constrained it is, the closer it will fit your expectations and the easier it will be to find things. That was something that I always uh, regretted a little bit uh, to, to see well, if I look at Python because Python is sort of has a different culture and it doesn't have types that actually can uh, can sustain very complex operations. A lot of the Python APIs are super, super simple. And that's a quality. That's great. That's what, what we should strive to get more of in, in Scala. But what if it doesn't happen? What if you deal with a library that does something crazy? Like I talked about implicits at the beginning of the talk. So um, what if the libraries that we use defines, let's say, an implicit conversion like this one here, from int to string? Well, maybe inspired by JavaScript. Uh, uh, so. Actually, things like this, maybe not from int to string, but from some type to unrelated type, just plonk in an implicit conversion there, they are unfortunately much more common in practice than you'd like to think. So if you use a library like that and you import the package with that implicit conversion, then instead of least power, you get maximal surprise in your code. <laughs> so one modest proposal that I, I have here is to say, well, for a conversion like this here, so you have a conversion from A to B, make it a style error if the conversion is not defined in one of the packages containing A or B and is itself public. So that means the thing I want to avoid is that essentially I have a type here, I have a type there, somebody else comes in a different package and says, let me relate the two with a magical conversion because that's so great and obviously nobody ever has thought of this, but I'm the first, but obviously it's a great idea to do that. So. So if that is the case, then you can do what, whatever you want in your own package, but outside your package, maybe for libraries that use that, that should be something that could be flagged as an error, as a style error. And if we want to do that, then the error checking has sort of to transcend libraries. So if a library uses these things and somebody uses the library, then I think the client fairly should be warned as well. Because it's the client who will have to suffer from that, from that conversion. So that requires some engineering how we want to do that. And the last thing has to do about flexibility. So Scala has great syntactic flexibility, and sometimes this can be a burden. And uh, for instance, I myself uh, essentially switched many, many times between this style here, xs.mavf, and that style here, xs underscore mapf. You might have your preference for one of the other, but uh, as I had, but my preference changed every couple of months uh, from one to the other, because it's not so easy. That's, I, I, I found no universal rule works works everywhere. Because what about, for instance, this one here versus this one here? And what about this versus that? So here I would say, well, probably the longer the lists are, the more legible the dots versus the infix. Whereas for something like min, you might argue, well, min is a very perfectly non-mathematical operator. It's, uh, it is uh, commutative, uh, so the asymmetric dot notation just is not aesthetic for min, right? So you could, you could say one or the other, and I'm, I'm sure people in this room would violently disagree about all of these points <laughs> with each other. So, the proposal that I have here is to just add an annotation, infix, that indicates that an operator is supposed to be used infix. So the provider of a library would say, well, I really think min makes sense as an operator infix. I don't, I, I don't really care whether the library provider says that or not. 
The important thing is that the users of that library agree on the usage, because otherwise you get essentially code bases where one part is infix and the other part, uh, other part isn't. So I propose to make it a style error if the operator is used in the wrong mode. So x min y would be okay, uh, whereas x s map f unless map is also annotated infix would give you a warning. And when we are at that, then I think we can go one step further and say for the symbolic uh, operators, Scala has of course gotten a lot of bad rap about symbolic operators, but most of that is in the past of us now, but I think there's still time to actually fix it and improve things. Uh, for the symbolic oper operators, we could actually require that the infix annotation gets a legible name, like append for plus equals. And it would be a style error if that alias is missing. So that would essentially say, well, you, you, we, we won't outlaw symbolic operators, they're very useful for Scala, but we will require that every symbolic operator comes with essentially a, a word that first says how to pronounce it, that's already a bit, <laughs> and, and second might give you some indication of what, what its meaning is. To be worked, so here I always talked about style errors, uh, so which sort of indicates that maybe the proper place for that is not the compiler but a lint tool or maybe a mode in the compiler that does the formatting and linting because there's this sort of uh, controversy that what we here talk about is very much essentially usability factors and they can change and they are a little bit ad hoc and in the compiler and the language you try to keep things as lean and clean as possible so these things typically tend to mess these uh, things up but I'm, I'm not completely decided about that either. Okay, so I think I have five, I have over, oh, yeah, it just spent one hour on it, so, which is probably more than I had. So thank you for listening. And